Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with If I Could Choose Only One Recording by Artist X, it would have to be their recording of Work B. Well, B in this case is salutary because Artist X is Otto Klemperer, and the B begins is the first letter, the last name of Brahms. Brahms, Brahms, Brahms. Got to be Brahms. Brahms First Symphony. Here it is. Good old Otto and Brahms first. Wow. Well, what can we say about the Klemperer Brahms first? Today, it's sort of out of style. That granitic is the word you always use when you talk about Klemperer. You can, you know, his middle name was granitic. Otto granitic Klemperer. I mean, that, that powerful, intense, rock solid, forged in steel um, approach, totally unsentimental slow and deliberate in the fast movements, rather quick in the slow movement, done completely without false sentimentality, rugged, honest, stripped bare of all inessentials, with the woodwind balances well to the fore to give Brahms orchestration, which can sound kind of clogged up, all of the color and transparency that it needs. There is no better recording of Brahms first ever. And like I said, the style that he's adopting is rather out of fashion these days. Oh, what a pity for us. There was a time when Brahms first was regarded, quite literally, as Beethoven's 10th. It was in that tradition. It's a, a tragedy to triumph journey. And that journey could be expressed in the most powerfully cosmic way, maybe even in an exaggerated way given what Brahms actually wrote. I mean, think about it. You know, the opening is marked poco sostenuto. A little tiny bit sustained. Just a little teensy, teensy, teensy bit sustained. And the dynamics are restrained. The timpani is only forte. And, you know, people like Fort Fangler, who was also part of the same, similar, similar school to Klemperer, those people, they were like, bang, bang, the crack of doom, the pounding timpani, a little bit sustained. Ooh, molto sostenuto. I mean, it was, it was like you know, you know, German Godzilla eats Berlin. I mean, it was, it was monster music. It was huge, and the and the climax with some sometimes some text textual adjustments some timpani under the final chorale, as Toscanini used to do. I mean, you know, people did everything they could to give Brahms a little extra, an extra zots, a little extra juice toward the end. Nowadays, of course, with the period instrument people and all that, the opening is chang, chang, cha, da, 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 you know, it's as if nothing's happening. And, and the textures, it's played with the chamber music with no vibrato and it all sounds, sounds just, just like Emily Dickinson, you know, if you want to put it that way. Kind of like a New England, New England recluse. Well, Brahms wasn't a New England recluse. He was a Viennese recluse. And recluses are different depending on where they are. And the first symphony is an epic piece. It is an epic piece. Now, you can play it for other reasons. It has other qualities, of course. But that that bigness is certainly built into it. And nobody was in a position to realize it better than Otto Klemperer. And, and the significance isn't just that he does that, that he does it with stunning playing and fabulous recording from EMI, but also because he was a living avatar of that style. I mean, remember, when he was born, Brahms was still around. I mean, he died, what, 1972? And... And he was born, he was 80-something, and so he was around in the 1880s. You know, when Brahms was around, he was from North Germany, where Brahms was from, more or less. You know, it, he was to the manner born. He understood that style as well as anybody possibly could. And so he had the provenance. And what makes me crazy about these people who talk about authenticity is they talk about authenticity when the people who are actually physically there and in a position to know what was authentic. People like Fortfinger and Toscanini and Cleverer and Monteux and all those people who adored Brahms, some of whom knew Brahms, who played him with complete idiomatic confidence and security. They made records. They made stereo records. 
They were there. They were there to tell us how much vibrato to use, how much this, how the balances should be, how tempi should be manipulated. What I mean, we've got millions of examples of Brahms interpretation from the time of people who were actually alive when Brahms was alive. And there is absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, I mean zero, that any authenticity or historically informed person can tell us about Brahms that is more legitimate than what people like Otto Klemperer did in that music. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So these, this is not only an outstanding Brahms first, one of the glories of the gramophone and of the Brahms discography, it is positively antiseptic when it comes to the bullshit that the period instrument people try to try to foist on us about what things must have sounded like in Brahms' day. It's all crap because what matters isn't what things may have sounded like. What matters is what would Brahms have recognized as a great performance of his music for in whatever perspective it takes or however it approached the music. And this is a great performance, one of the very greatest. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.